So welcome to the webinar from the Instruct Eric series Structure Meets Function. Today, this presentation from the Czech National Center. These webinars feature expert speakers from Instruct centers across Europe, highlight some of the latest developments in structural biology, and demonstrate how integrative methods are enabling scientists to decipher the mechanism and the pin health and disease. I think INSTRUCT is a well-established European Infrastructure Consortium for Integrative Structural Biology. Doesn't need much of an introduction. You have heard it several times, but just the essentials. INSTRUCT has been an important player in the European Strategy Forum on Research Infrastructures in 2006. The consortium itself was established during the European Research Infrastructure Preparatory Phase of the S3 Roadmap and became operational in 2012. It was soon recognized as a landmark project on the 2016 S3 roadmap. And already in July 2017, INSTRUCT uh, gained the status of ERIC. And ERIC, just for you to remember, stands for the European Research Infrastructure Consortium which refers to a specific legal form that facilitates the establishment and operation of research fractures in the European research area. INSTRUCT is currently formed by 15 members, 14 out of them are countries, which pay the subscription annual fees, which allow scientists from across the Europe to arrange a services and expertise of the centers. And in November last year, uh, the 15th member became EMBL with locations in Grenoble, Heidelberg, and Hamburg. Currently, INSTRUCT comprises 10 INSTRUCT centers that offer access to 23 facilities across Europe. Well, today I will stay a little bit longer about our national center INSTRUCT CZ, which is formed by the Czech Infrastructure for Integrative Structural Biology, shortcut CIISB. CIISB is a distributed infrastructure constituted by core facilities of SATEC in Brno and BIOSEF, which is located near Prague in a small village, Vestets. We operate 10 high end core facilities. And we have expertise in NMR, X-ray crystallography and crystallization, cryo-electron microscopy tomography, biophysical characterization of biomolecules, nanobiotechnology products, and structural mass spectrometry. Out of these 10 core facilities, four are considered to host the flagship technologies. In Brno, we have a high-end cryo-electron microscopy and tomography lab equipped with Titan Cryos, Talos Arctica, Talos 200, and Versa 3D. And this facility allows you to do the single particle cryo-electron microscopy, cryo-electron tomography, and also electron diffraction experiments at the top-notch equipment. We also host the Joseph Dalek National NMR Center, which is equipped with spectrometers ranging from 500 to 950 megahertz, mostly equipped with cryoprobes, and specialized on a structure determination, dynamical studies of uh, solution uh, components in NMR. You also have some basics for solids. In Prague, there are two flagship technologies, one focused on a diffraction techniques equipped with a uh, Brooker Venture diffractometer with high flux uh, gallium metal jet source and the SACS point to uh, equipment for the measurement of SACS equipped also with a metal jet X-ray source. In addition, Biosev hosts the structural mass spectrometry facility equipped with a 15 Tesla SOARX FTICR mass spectrometer, which allows you to study post-translational modification and structural uh, studies of proteins and complexes in solution. Well, maybe here I would like to emphasize that our core facilities are available through various channels and we are welcoming proposal submissions and we allow measurements at our facility using resources of INSTRUCT ERIC, INEX Discovery, and also uh, thanks to the funding from the Ministry of Education and Use of the Czech Republic, we can provide you with the measurement and expertise as a very discounted prices. 
our price level is around the 10 percent, 10 to 15 percent from the actual cost of the measurement. So if you want to access us, please go to our website and look at it. And just to conclude my short introduction, I would like to repeat the motto, which was basically formulated already 50 years ago, well before the structural biology started to develop and flourish. And this was encoded by Stephen Fogel and Stephen Weinreich. And the motto says, structure without function is corpse, function without structure is ghost. So please don't forget whatever you study, that structure is needed to decipher the function. And this is what these seminars are also about. Before I introduce the speakers, I would like to remind you that the session will be recorded. If you will have a questions at the end of each lecture, please ask those questions through the Q&A uh, written form because it will speed up the uh, answers. I will read the questions and the uh, speakers will respond. If there is any urgent need for you to communicate directly, please here raise your hand in the lower panel and you will be allowed to speak to all the audience. So with this, I would like to close my short introduction and I will introduce the first speaker. The first speaker is Pavel Plevka. Pavel got a PhD degree from Uppsala University with Lars Lillias in 2009. And then he spent four years as a postdoc with Michael Rossman at Purdue University. In 2013, he, he joined CETEC in Bano, where he is now a research group leader of the group which is focused on structural biology. He has been very successful in obtaining grants to start his career. He was an ERC starting grant. Now he's, he's running ERC CZ consolidator grant, EMBO installation grant, obtained a number of other funding, which allows him to build a large group and have excellent results. His research is focused on human picornar viruses, honeybean viruses, uh, human flaviviruses and phage therapy. And I'm sure that Pavel will, take, uh, will uh, give you much more information about his current research interest. So thank you very much for listening to me and Pavel, the floor, screen and microphone is now yours. Thank you for a very uh, kind introduction. Uh, so today uh, I'd like to present you some of our, of our results describing uh, enterovirus genome release and delivery. So uh, enteroviruses are one of the largest groups of viruses uh, that cause, for example, common cold. Uh, these are rhinoviruses with more than 100 of serotypes. However, enteroviruses are not only about uh, running nose. So they can uh, cause uh, bleeding disease of eyes, uh, hand, foot and mouth disease, or uh, brain inflammation that can actually lead to temporary or permanent brain damage. Uh, in our result, uh, in our studies, uh, we focus on uh, analyzing how these viruses uh, infect cells and how they replicate inside them. Here is a brief summary of enterovirus replication cycle. Uh, the viruses enter cells by receptor-mediated endocytosis, and then uh, the particles end up uh, within endosome. Through not well characterized process, the genome of enteroviruses is delivered into cytoplasm. The genome is single-stranded positive sense RNA molecule uh, that at its five prime end uh, contains internal ribosomal entry site sequence that folds into specific structure that recruits the ribosome and initiates translation. Uh, the whole genome is translated into a single long polyprotein that uh, autocatalytically cleaves into functional uh, subunits uh, that take over control of the cell. Uh, they induce formation of so-called virus replication factories. Uh, these are uh, membrane vesicles derived from the endoplasmatic reticulum that are decorated by viral uh, proteins that uh, mediate replication of the virus RNA. Uh, these are also sites uh, of translation of virus proteins and assembly of progeny particles. The progeny variants are released from cells uh, upon cell lysis and they can go on and infect uh, more cells. So in my today's talk, uh, I'll focus on the step uh, how the genome is released from the virus particle and um, transported across the endosome membrane into cell cytoplasm. 
there is a scheme uh, that I made uh, several years ago uh, that summarizes uh, the theories of how uh, this process happens in detail. So here we have the receptor-mediated endocytosis. And when the virus is uh, inside the endosome uh, exposed to acidified pH, uh, it triggers conformational changes of the particles. Uh, they change to so-called activated conformation that is characterized by particle expansion. It's a little bit overemphasized here in the image uh, and leads to release of minor capsid proteins, uh, VP4, that are shown as this uh, orange shapes that uh, were shown and these proteins were shown to interact with membranes. Also, n termini of capsid proteins VP1 are externalized from the particle and in, may interact with membrane. The activated particles were in in vitro experiments shown to uh, release the genomes. And it has been speculated that the genome release may occur through pores uh, along a twofold axis of icosahedral symmetry of these particles. However, uh, this theory is somewhat problematic because the pores uh, on the twofold axis are uh, too small to enable passage of the single stranded RNA. And also, uh, the diffusion uh, of the RNA uh, through this small pore would be a very slow process, uh, which would expose the genome to degradation by RNases that are picked up into the endosome lumen together with the virus particles from the extracellular space. Uh, then also there are alternative theories how the genome may be transported across the endosome membrane. So the first speculation is that the viral proteins form some sort of transmembrane channel that serves as a conduit for the genome release. And the alternative theory is that the viral proteins induce disintegration of the uh, endosome membrane and the virus can directly uh, escape uh, into cell cytoplasm. And here uh, I'd like to switch to our results. Uh, so to study the process of enterovirus infection, uh, we decided to look uh, directly uh, on the process inside of infected cells. We took the advantage of COS7 cells that can be uh, grown uh, directly on the grids for electron microscopy, and they form uh, this broad lamellipodia uh, that in their peripheral parts are thin enough to be transparent for electron microscope. Here is image from uh, transmission electron microscopy. Uh, showing one uh, single square uh, from the grid. And in the center, uh, you, you can see a cell. Its central part is dark, too thick to be transparent, but the peripheral, peripheral parts um, are in these shades of gray. So we can uh, get some uh, information on what's going on inside of the cell. This is a collage image uh, recorded with higher magnification, uh, composed uh, from several images that actually are still low dose, but allow us to, uh, but allow us to visualize what's actually going on inside of the cell and identify uh, endosomes uh, as uh, membrane-bound compound uh, compartments uh, that are of interest to us if we want to look at how the infection proceeds. Uh, so. Here, uh, I am showing you endosomes from control cells, uh, which have a smooth surface. Uh, here you can see two endosomes next to each other, actually sitting uh, within a hole uh, in the EM grid. And uh, you may notice that the endosomes can be surrounded by single membrane, or in this case, double membrane. And uh, this is natural process. So uh, normally in cells, actually endosome can be uh, multi-membrane structures. Uh, when we infect the cells, uh, the <clears throat> shape of the endosomes uh, changes dramatically. So we uh, observe this uh, effect of deformation of the endosome membrane uh, that we call uh, membrane warping. Uh, so these are uh, projection images. And to uh, increase the contrast, I'll show you a section uh, from a reconstructed tomogram where actually the uh, edge of the endosome and the uh, uh, individual virus particle, particles inside the endosome uh, stand out in better contrast. Uh, in this image on the right side, uh, I'll show you actually a movie uh, slicing uh, through the endosome uh, to show that the particles are not sitting on top uh, of the cell or below, but that they are actually uh, inside uh, of the endosome compartment. When we uh, allow the infection to pro uh, progress uh, for a little bit longer, uh, we can actually see that this uh, membrane warping uh, 
proceeds to uh, extreme state uh, that results in uh, disruption of the endosome membranes. And then, uh, so in this image, uh, the membranes are highlighted by the uh, semi-transparent magenta color. Uh, individual genome containing virus particles by green circles and empty capsids by red uh, rings. We actually <coughs> can collect tomograms from these cells, but also uh, record single particle uh, images uh, that allow us to uh, calculate reconstructions of these particles and determine them to high resolution and use all the uh, techniques that are uh, available for the single particle reconstruction, like uh, classification that uh, enable us to identify uh, specific states of these particles. So when we look at the genome containing particles, uh, it turns out that all of them are actually in the native state. So uh, in spite of the expectations, even though these particles went uh, through the uh, endosomes um, and were exposed to mildly acidic pH, they uh, remained in the native conformation. And then uh, we can calculate the uh, reconstruction of these uh, empty capsids, and they uh, very well correspond to the structures that were uh, characterized uh, in vitro uh, before um, to empty capsids that resulted from the genome release. So these data uh, actually provide evidence that the genome release of uh, enteroviruses occurs only in the cytoplasm, where the particles very quickly go through the transformation to A particles, then release the genome, uh, and we observe the resulting empty capsids. Uh, in my second part of the talk, uh, I'll characterize the process uh, of genome release. Uh, but uh, first, I'd like to uh, mention uh, that the process of endosome disruption uh, is actually not due uh, to the virus proteins, but we think that it's actually the virus abusing some natural process that the cell can use for membrane remodeling. Because if we look uh, into control cells that have not been infected by the virus, and we image uh, hundreds of the endosomes there, actually in about 10% of them, uh, we can see this membrane uh, warping. So we think that the virus uh, has some mechanism to overactivate a pathway uh, that stimulates this membrane remodeling, the membrane warping. Uh, and this actually enables the, the virus to abuse the cellular mechanism to ensure its release into the cell cytoplasm. And now uh, to the process of uh, genome release itself. So here uh, we perform the experiments in vitro and we took particles of Echovirus 18 uh, and exposed them to acidic pH. And here we were actually lucky enough to capture the particles in the process of uh, genome release. Uh, so individual uh, micrographs uh, in transmission electron microscopy are uh, difficult to interpret, but we uh, employed the method of reference-free uh, two-dimensional uh, classification. And uh, it became very clear uh, that these particles actually uh, lack parts of their uh, capsids, capsids. And then uh, if we look at the individual images that were used for calculation of these uh, averages, uh, we can actually see that the genomes are being captured uh, in the process of escape uh, from the protein shell. Uh, of course, these images could be used to calculate uh, three-dimensional reconstructions. Uh, that, are, uh, that are shown here, and they show uh, that these particles actually like uh, one, two, or three uh, pentamers. So now the question arises, uh, why actually this uh, process, like why, what's the force uh, behind opening of the particles? So there are uh, important changes that occur when the uh, particles of enteroviruses are exposed to acidic pH. Uh, we start with uh, virions uh, at neutral pH that you see uh, in the left image. And um, you can see that the genomes inside the particles are um, sort of equally uh, distributed. But when the particles are exposed to acidic pH and transformed to this uh, activated form, uh, the distribution of the genome uh, changes to grainy. So th there has been some uh, reorganization. Here, uh, I'll step uh, outside of the realm of enteroviruses uh, because we obtained uh, interesting complementary uh, results when studying honeybee viruses. Uh, this is a virus in a native state at neutral pH. 
And this virus is special because it caps it can become very flexible when it's exposed to acidic pH. So here is a structure uh, that is uh, massively expanded uh, by 30% uh, in acidic pH. But also uh, in the acidic pH, we can observe particles uh, that lack the genome. And they are, these are not as much expanded. So actually comparison of these two structures in acidic pH indicates uh, that the genome is pushing on the inside on the capsid, uh, inducing its expansion. And then uh, we could use this uh, information to simulate uh, what happens when the genome is pushing from the inside of the particle. And uh, when perf by performing numerous uh, simulations, uh, we can identify that the opening of the capsids uh, usually happens like a Pac-Man, uh, that the capsid breaks into approximately two halves. And in this process, uh, in some cases, one or a few pentamers of the capsid proteins can be uh, broken away from the complex and the genome, uh, genome is released very quickly uh, through diffusion, uh, actually uh, in the order of hundreds of nanoseconds. So the speed of the process uh, also protects the genome from being degraded uh, while it is being released from the capsid. And with this, uh, I'd like to summarize our results describing the uh, cell entry, uh, delivery into the cytoplasm and delivery of the genome from the virus capsid. So after binding to the uh, receptors, uh, the enterovirus particles are endocytosed. And uh, it's probably the interaction with the receptor that induces activation of a cellular pathway uh, that triggers the membrane warping uh, that becomes uh, extreme and leads to endosome disruption. Then uh, when the particles are exposed uh, to the cell cytoplasm, uh, they uh, quickly transform into the activated particles uh, that we, however, could not observe experimentally in the infected cells, uh, resulting in uh, capsid opening, genome release, and formation of empty particles. Uh, with this, uh, I'd like to thanks to um, members of my group, uh, in particular to uh, Aigul Ishemgulova, uh, who worked on the uh, analysis of infection in situ uh, in the infected cells, and to David Buchta, who analyzed the process of uh, an Echovirus 18 genome release in vitro. I'd like to also thank to SATEC uh, and to our funders, and thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much for your nice talk, and also thank you for keeping time now we have time for questions. I'm looking at the chat. There's already the very first one coming from uh, Matt Arnold. And the question reads, thanks for an excellent talk, Pavel. Wonder if you have any idea what signal in the cytoplasm is causing the release of RNA, but uh, capsid dissolution. There are a couple of clues that the capsid uh, receives or that the virus particle receives when entering the cell. So first is the binding of the receptor uh, that I didn't talk about, but it uh, triggers some changes in the structure of the virus. Uh, it's not the full activation of the particle, but some structural changes. And then uh, when the particle is released from the endosome to the cytoplasm, uh, there is change in ionic uh, uh, composition. So we think uh, it's, this, uh, it's this change that ultimately triggers the genome release. So there's another question from Abar Mansour. So is it the process of endocytosis of the virus that causes the deformation in the endosomes and then, then leads to integration? This is a very good question and we are not sure, but uh, definitely uh, the virus, when it attaches uh, to, re to receptor at the cell surface, it doesn't bind to only one receptor molecule, but it will uh, bind to a number of them. And this results in uh, receptor clustering. And the, um, this triggers the endocytosis, but also may promote uh, this um, warping of the endosome membrane because there is uh, extensive signaling from the clustered receptor. I don't see any other questions so far, but maybe I can ask you, Pavel. You know, yesterday I heard a lecture of Holger Stark and he clearly demonstrated the limits uh, of the atomic resolution studies using a single particle cryo-EM. You are involved in studies of, uh, of cryo, using cryo-electron tomography. How do you see the limits of resolution which can be 
obtained using this approach? Uh, okay, so, so to, to clarify, actually the reconstructions that I've uh, presented today uh, were uh, obtained by single particle reconstru uh, reconstruction. So we, uh, we took number of uh, projection images uh, of cells and then use them as if they were uh, like pu purified viruses. So th these suffer a little bit from less uh, signal to noise ratio because the uh, cells are thicker than when the samples are no normally prepared. Uh, the highest resolution we could obtain with this approach was uh, so far for angstrom. Uh, when, when it comes to tomography, uh, well, with uh, subtomogram averaging, uh, the resolution can approach three angstrom, and uh, there are other experts that can provide much more detailed analysis of this challenge. Okay, uh, there are, there is another question, but before that, I think there is a very nice comment from Dave Stewart. Beautiful work, Pavel answers some long-standing problems and raises new questions. And then we have a question from uh, from Arun uh, Prabha. Thanks for amazing, Dr. Pavel. I would like to ask you if the mechanism of BP protein assisted in rapid destruction of membrane is elucidated. Yeah, so th this is something uh, we do not understand. There are numerous cellular pathways or complexes that could be involved, like uh, escort, retromer, retriever complexes, nexin and wash complexes. Uh, it's possible that uh, some of the uh, RAP GTPases are activated. And uh, because of this extensive pinching, like st stretching of the endosome um, membranes, uh, it's likely that actually some cy cytoskeleton is also uh, involved. So this indeed uh, raises a number number of questions. Pavel, thank you very much. And uh, we can move to uh, next uh, lecture. Okay, I hope you see the announcement of the second talk, which will be given by Jan de Honalek. The title is Sweeping RNA Polymerase, Role of Protein, HEID in Bacterial Transcription. Jan obtained a PhD from the Czech Technical University in Prague in 2000. And then he spent uh, four years with uh, Kate Wilson at the University of York. Since 2005, he has been a group uh, leader at the Institute of Molecular, uh, Macromolecular Chemistry at Czech Academy of Sciences in Prague. And since 2016, he's a research group leader and head of a Center for Molecular Structure at Bioset essentially uh, four, core, four core facilities of CIISB are at his command. His primary research areas is a structure determination of biological macromolecules using primarily cryo, uh, uh, sorry, X-ray crystallography, but as you will hear today, he's also using a cryo-electron microscopy. And uh, without a further ado, Jan, I think the stage is yours, and we are looking forward to hear your contribution to the, the seminar series. So good morning, everybody. Uh, and uh, I'm grateful for this opportunity um, that I can uh, share the results uh, with, the, with the instruct audience. Uh, I'll be talking about RNA polymerase uh, and uh, about the protein HELD. Um, and this work was done uh, with great collaboration with Lebor Krasny from the Institute of Microbiology here in Prague, and, uh, and it would not be possible without Tomáš Kuba uh, from EMBL Grenoble, who is actually now in Prague. Now, our group, as Vladimir said, uh, uh, is mostly doing uh, structural function studies on enzymes and enzyme complexes, and also on receptors. And in this work, uh, it was mostly Tomáš Kuba who was dealing with this protein for a long time. Now to transcription in bacteria, uh, it, it's a fairly basic concept. I don't have to explain too much. So uh, RNA polymerase consists of alpha subunits, beta, beta prime, and it needs, uh, it needs uh, protein factors such as sigma to be able to initiate uh, transcription on the DNA template and produce RNA. And in various types of bacteria, the, the protein factors it needs uh, differ. Now, um, we started working with, uh, with Vibor Krasny um, quite a few years ago. And around that time, the protein 
HELD or then gene uh, YVGS actually in Bacillus subtilis was discovered, identified to bind RNA polymerase by Delamere et al. Uh, and it was termed a putative helicase because it had features of SF1 helicases with this size, about 90 kilodalton protein. And um, it seemed to be close to helicases uh, such as UVRD protein from E. coli. And we've spent uh, years and years uh, trying to study this uh, protein uh, structurally. Uh, there were literally thousands of uh, crystallization trials spent on this. And I know that we were not the only lab in the world who was doing this work. Um, and, and some results actually were, um, were doable or were acceptable uh, as for the functional studies, uh, not so much as for the structural analyses. What was um, clear um, for the Bacillus subtilis LD is that uh, it enhances transcription um, and it has some optimal um, ratio to the RNA polymerase where it enhances the most. This enhancement of transcription is actually um, ATP dependent in Bacillus subtilis, that's clear. And um, it could be also shown that the, um, the healthy interaction with RNA polymerase is not uh, somehow clearly dependent on uh, DNA or nucleic acids presence in general. And I'm not showing those details. Uh, we were also interested, of course, in the localization of healthy on RNA polymerase. And this was then done by Peter Luce from Australia, who used far Western blotting. And this was published uh, quite a few years ago. And it was clear from this experiment that RNA polymerase would actually bind healthy most intensively somewhere close to the secondary, uh, secondary channel of RNA polymerase. And that's the channel whereby the nucleotides come for the new RNA um, to come to existence. We looked at the sequence then and playing with the sequences, it became clear that actually HELD um, as opposed to the UVRD or similar other helicases, would have um, the ATPase unit present, that's the 1A and 1A, two parts of the first domain of the ATPase, and this is the second part of the ATPase, is a typical two Rossmann fold domains that, that form the ATPases in many other proteins and also in UVRD. But in the case of HELD, actually that the first domain would be clearly split by a different sequence. And we called it just healthy specific because it was so different that we couldn't find really anything similar to it. While the N-terminal part of the protein would uh, uh, remind us of very distantly of the GRI A uh, proteins that were able to bind uh, into the secondary channel of RNA polymerase. We also tried to get some structural data at that time for the Bacillus subtilis HLD. At least what we could get uh, were the X-ray scattering data, so SACS data for the protein per se. And it was clear that when binding the non-cleavable analog of ATP, it had different shapes and it had different signals than uh, without any binding in the active site. And this was the typical triangular shape we were getting on, on and on again and again. Uh, and then these two differed. So yes, the function was definitely connected with, uh, uh, with structural changes of the protein, which probably somehow helped the recycling of the RNA polymerase. And it also could somehow correlate the UVRD and RAPI, RAPA structures. And in part, we were able to, to model the Bacillus subtilis HLD. What was really interesting that um, about of, of the many constructs we tried to produce to, to tackle the protein structurally, uh, it was really only the removal of the N-terminal domain that was feasible uh, for the solubility of the product. And the removal of the healthy N-terminal domain had some consequences. Uh, interestingly, the um, ATPase activity was conserved. Okay, the N-terminal domain is not involved in that. Binding to RNA-P core was also conserved. We could still see binding. Um, but 
it seemed to be the fact that the entertainment domain is actually essential for the transcription recycling uh, in bacillus subtilis, at least. Um, so the, the function was actually hampered by doing this. And now we're switching to mycobacterium because in the in bacillus subtilis, we spend really years on the structural work. And uh, in mycobacterium, this worked much better, at least for us. Now, mycobacteria include pathogens uh, causing serious diseases, such as tuberculosis and M. smegmatis, the proven model organism. Um, there are, they have different accessory proteins as for transcription. And in, uh, in mycobacterium smegmatis, polymerase requires uh, sigma factor RBPA and CAR-D to bind and melt DNA and to initiate transcription. At that point, uh, the structures from Mycobacterium smegmatis of RNA polymerase uh, transcription initiation complex uh, was known and, uh, from the Campbell team in 2017. And then also the core and whole enzyme forms um, from the collaboration of Libor Krasny with, uh, with Tomasz Kuba in 2019. Um, but we had no idea how the healthy protein would actually bind to this complex and what this would look like. Um, the rna core was expressed in E. coli, purified by cetaminohistac on, on link beta beta prime, and healthy was produced uh, in E. coli as well, purified by antaminohistac with a TAF cleavage site. And with uh, Tomasz Kuba, we performed the cryo -M study uh, with the, with the core of Mycobacterium smegmatis um, RNA polymerase and added HLD. Uh, the complex was purified by gel filtration and the best complex was then put on the grids. And the high resolution data in the end were taken at the SRF Mobile and SATEC Beno uh, between three and four angstroms resolution. Okay, so um, this is what the complexes look like on the representative uh, micrographs, and I must say that it did take some optimization of the samples and, and some uh, fiddling with the data collection. Um, and there were some preferential, preferential orientation problems, but they were not as serious, actually, as in the uh, bacillus subtilis uh, data collections that were performed in a parallel project. And, and the, the data in the end provided three main classes of the structures and the, uh, we termed the three main classes state one, state two and state three, at uh, three-ish or, or three and a half angstrom resolution. Uh, and uh, this is the first view of the structure of RNA polymerase in gray and these colors for the extra domains here and for the alphas. And in, in, in the full colors is the healthy protein uh, forming a crescent-like structure actually sitting on um, RNA polymerase. And this is the local resolution coloring. So you can see that most of the healthy protein can be nicely localized in the structure. Um, now, looking at the most important bit now, uh, we're looking into the active site actually of um, RNA polymerase with the key magnesium ion uh, where the uh, new RNA would be born, and in purple is HLD reaching from the primary channel directly to the active site of RNA polymerase. This is in state two of the complex and is getting uh, direct to the site, so it removes everything from polymerase. And this is the key feature of HLD function. So in state one, you can see the protein um, with the domain naming in here, how it binds into the secondary channel where normally nucleotides would come to the active site and it also binds to the primary channel where the downstream DNA would be placed right here. In state two, the conformation is similar but actually the primary channel loop that first was only engaged in the primary channel is now really interfering and is deep in the active site. And we also observe state three, uh, where it's only the N-terminal part of HLD and the primary channel loop uh, localizable, and the rest of the protein is not localizable. Now, these are um, the three forms uh, as for the HLD structure. The N-terminal cold, cold domain uh, goes directly into the secondary channel, 
but actually it doesn't block the channel. So it would be the active side would be still accessible. And the primary channel loop interestingly changes its fault between state one and state two. In state three, the primary channel loop is basically in the same conformation. Now there are enormous changes uh, between state one and state two as for the primary channel. And this is now moving between one and two. Uh, the interactions differ between the clamp and the healthy specific domain and the primary channel loop actually refolds and makes completely different structure. In state one, uh, the great part of the loop is not uh, visible, whereas this is all localizable in state two. Now, looking into the active site, uh, we have the orange primary channel loop reaching the active site and basically removing anything that could be present in the active site. So this is overlap with the thermos thermophilus elongation complex and the template and non-template DNA um, cannot be present. And the N-terminal part, the N-terminal domain, um, um, forces formation of the fold of the trigger loop and also disables actually the function of the of RNA polymerase in this place. And this is just 90 degree uh, rotation of the beam. Now the opening is enormous. Um, when you move from initiation complex to the presence of HLD, the opening goes to about 45 angstroms from lysines uh, on the opposite sides and is much bigger than in the core or hollow structure and is actually much bigger than uh, in the lipiamycin locked and uh, fidexamycin locked states of um, RNA polymerase. And this also causes opening of the RNA exit channel, and I'm not showing this here, so it literally sweeps the RNA polymerase. Nothing can really stay in there. And uh, it can, of course, block or temporarily in inhibit polymerase in its function. Now, this can be shown also experimentally. Um, so when you uh, create artificially elongation complex on, on beads and then add HLD, HLD starts removing polymerase from uh, the nucleic acids. And you can detect uh, RNA polymerase by um, anti-beta antibody. And it is clear that upon addition of HLD, uh, you start releasing polymerase. And this not, does not seem to be GTP or ATP dependent. Uh, at least not clearly. Okay. Now, yes, it should be an ATPase, and this is the this is the ATPase unit uh, of the protein, and these are the parts of polymerase. And when you compare this um, uh, with the uh, with UVRD, um, some um, typical uh, motifs in the ATPase on or the ATP binding site are conserved, but some features uh, which are typical in UVRD or FA for binding of DNA are not conserved on this surface. And also on HLD, the electrostatics of this part uh, differs completely. So uh, it is not repeating the, the same idea of um, DNA binding and the uh, ATPase um, here serves a completely different purpose. Okay. And it can be shown, and it was shown that uh, the protein itself has ATPase and actually GTPase activity, uh, but the CTP is not cleaved uh, by, the, by the protein, by the enzyme. Now, this is when we look at the UVRD active site, uh, binding the non-cleavable um, analog of ATP, um, all nicely placed and making sense. Oops. Okay. Now, when we actually uh, overlap state one, you can already see that things are not quite in the place that the putative ATP binding site is not freely open for binding ATP. And it's also blocked by the NG linker, NG linker in the darker colors on the left. And when I overlap this with the, with state two of HLD, um, the NG linker there actually is not present. It is not folded anymore. Uh, it's disordered, and something happens here at the bottom. Histidine two four one goes away with its helix, which then goes towards the primary channel loop. So probably the inhibition within the active site is somehow connected with the changes around the ATP binding site. But functionally, this was not really detected that it would be ATP dependent. Not not yet. And uh, this is a bit of a mystery. 
uh, despite our trials, we have never seen uh, ATP or the ATP analog in the active site bound, but certainly it should be somehow possible. So we have the model here, uh, the stalled elongation complex happens and then um, LD, if it's around, we think it first actually binds to the, uh, uh, to the secondary channel and upon binding of the secondary channel, it already starts releasing the DNA. And when, it's, when it is doing so, it can go probably to state one, this is the idea at least, and start removing completely downstream DNA, and then going to state two, when it interferes directly with the active site, it removes everything or anything from the complex. Now, we've also seen that sigma does bind and can bind together with HLD, and I haven't shown the data on the complex. Uh, so the binding of sigma could actually uh, start the process of going back into the functional state where the HLD, of course, would have to be released for the next transcriptional cycle. And the release of HLD is not clear at the moment, and uh, we assume it should require NTP hydrolysis, but it is not absolutely clear as well. Now, there were parallel efforts on the structure from Bacillus satellis HLD complex, uh, both from Australia, Peter Lewis and Marcus Wall in Germany. And uh, we joined the efforts actually, and we uh, started working together and we were exchanging the manuscripts. So all the three publications came out at the same time in major communications last year. Now what's happening in Bacillus satellis um, the, the healthy looks slightly different, as you can see here. Uh, it also interferes uh, largely in the secondary channel and also in the primary channel, um, but it's not so complex in the primary channel as in Mycobacterium. Uh, now, in this way, um, as Peter presented the, uh, in a popular way, what healthy does, um, giving its punch uh, first through the secondary channel and then the upper cut, as he called it, in the primary channel of polymerase, again, to remove nucleic acids. So it is doing the same job and that's the, that's the basic idea. But it does look different. And, and here in, um, in blue, we have the Bacillus subtilis um, and in orange, our Mycobacterium healthy. And you can see the differences in the primary channel. And in the case of Marcus Wall's structure, there is also delta present, uh, which has interesting con con uh, consequences. And when you look from the top, um, in Bacillus satellites, you're reaching the active site uh, with the N-terminal part of the protein, which is not happening in Mycobacterium. So already the N-terminal part, the cold coil, disables the function of the active site of polymerase. In our case, it's the other arm doing this job. And the second arm going to the primary channel in Bacillus subtilis has similar job, but does it actually differently in Bacillus subtilis. So in summary, um, healthy in Bacterium smegmatis um, very efficiently removes nucleic acids from the polymerase complex. Uh, you can call it a broom which holds onto its target, so it, it, it sweeps and stays, uh, and um, we still need more data and actually how the release is realized and what the ATP or NTP activity means in this. Um, the most likely target are stalled elongation complexes, and in the states uh, one, two, and three, uh, we think we're seeing actually the process of binding or the formation of the complex and perhaps even the release, still more data would be needed there. The NTPase activity purpose, um, it seems so, sort of obvious, it should help removing LD from the complex, but so far this was not confirmed. Um, and it is possible that a multi-complex, multi-complex is formed between RNAP, LD and other proteins. And of course we're working in that direction. And this all actually forms a, a potential for antibiotics development, because if you could somehow help, uh, in a sense, uh, the bacterium keep the complex blocked, uh, that, that would block the transcription process in the bacterium. And there are definitely marked differences between Mycobacterium and Bacillus subtilis, uh, which um, could mean that the proteins develop differently. And this is uh, markedly actually seen in the interference with the active site of 
um, RNA polymerase. So this was, uh, of course, collaborative effort. Uh, the in our institute, um, uh, a lot of work was done by Tomáš Koval, uh, but also by other members of the team. A great collaboration with Libor that's ongoing, and Petra Suzinova um, uh, had a lot of work in this. Uh, the cryogram analysis would be impossible without Tomáš Koba. We also acknowledge collaboration with Masaryk University, Lukáš Žídek, his team, Irka Nováček, who enabled the um, data collection. There was a bit of crystallography present. I actually didn't talk about that. And thanks for that to Katsuhiko and Yuri, um, and also to uh, Marcus Wall and Peter Lewis for this, for this great, great collaboration in uh, the submission and comparison of three different manuscripts on the same topic and the facilities and funding. And thank you for your attention. Yeah, and thank you very much for a very nice and clear presentation. Uh, we have time for questions. Okay, is there any role of DNA RNA confirmation? Bogdan asks you. Yes, um, no, that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't seem to be uh, actually, because, the, because once you bind uh, LD, all the DNA and RNA seems to be gone. Okay, so the last speaker is Lukas Trantirek from Seitek Masaryk University, and he will talk about probing structures and interactions of nucleic acids in living human cells using NMR spectroscopy. Lukasz got a PhD from Masaryk University in 2001. Then he spent two years as a postdoc with Julie Fagan at the University of California in Los Angeles. And then additional uh, one and a half year with uh, Norbert Miller at Johannes Kepler University in Linz. Then he became a researcher at the University of South Bohemia, uh, Ceske Budjovice. Then he spent a few years at the Department of Chemistry, University of Utrecht. And finally, in 2013, he joined SATEC and became a research group leader. And his research group uh, carries the title Non-Coding Genome. His research areas and my main objective are listed on the on the slide, I don't need to read it. And I'm pretty sure that Lukáš will talk about his recent research in more details during his presentation. So Lukáš, thank you for giving a talk and uh, the screen and microphone is yours. Okay, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, this lecture will be methodological mostly, and um, I slightly need to modify the title. It won't be about nucleic acids in general. It will be mostly, let's say, exclusively about the DNA. So I do apologize. In contrast to protein structure or RNA structure, the DNA is somehow special. It actually is very sensitively modulated by environmental factors. One can say that DNA senses the environment. And that unfortunately translates into uh, uh, problems in addressing physiologically relevant DNA structures. And this can be exemplified on the case of telomeric DNA, which is a repetitive G-rich sequence, which adopts so-called G-quadruplex structures. And unfortunately, as you can see, the structures are function of the experimental setup. So if you perform NMR solution analysis in the presence of sodium, you will end up with 3D structure corresponding to something which is called antiparallel basket, specific topology. However, if you perform the analysis in the crystalline state in the presence of potassium, you will observe completely different topology referred to as parallel proper quadruplex. And if you run exactly the same type of analysis in solution in the presence of potassium, you will end up again with completely different structure. If you reanalyze your data again with NMR in solution, however, you include additional factors such as molecular crowding, uh, you will see a conformation of preference change again into the parallel structure. So, this is sort of special situation. We have one biological function and we have at least three, as a matter of fact, there are at least six different folding topologies 
right now known for this DNA. And the question is, how do we assess whether or which in vitro structural data is physiologically relevant? We are basically hitting the problem. On one hand, we have very precise structural information, but the question remains, is it really also accurate information? And we have been for more than 10 years developing the technology which is referred to as in-cell NMR of nucleic acid. And the, the idea behind this approach is to correlate in vivo function, not with in vitro structural data, but with the data that are derived under physiologically relevant conditions, in this case, in living cells. Uh, the concept uh, is relatively simple. Um, instead of analyzing DNA or RNA structure, but let's stick to the DNA um, in a buffered solution, we take the DNA fragment, we somehow insert it into the cell, hopefully at the physiologically relevant location into the cell nucleus. And then we perform pretty much conventional NMR analysis on the suspension of the transformed cells. Uh, until recently, this technology was restricted to uh, Xenopus livis oocytes, which are eukaryotic model cells that are large enough uh, for, uh, for mechanical micro injection uh, of the concentrated stock solution. Um, I would like to just highlight that stock solutions used are usually around 1.5 to 3 millimolar. So basically at the concentration level where you start to observe uh, oligomerization artifacts. And maybe what is interesting that intracellular concentration of delivered uh, DNA are in the range between 150 to 250 micromolar. It will make sense a little bit later. Uh, if you are trying to perform such an experiment, you will face the several technical challenges. And the first one is how to introduce the DNA oligonucleotide into the cell nucleus. The injection can be performed only into the cytosol. Luckily enough, there is an unknown mechanism, but well characterized. Um, characterized general consensus is that there is a, an unknown mechanism, sorry. Once the DNA touches cytosol, it gets essentially immediately spontaneously localized into the cell nucleus. And the localization is essentially quanti uh, quantitative. No one knows how it works, but uh, it can be shown that the DNA that is localized in the nucleus is not bound to, the, to proteins, and it's actually freely tumbling. The second technical challenge is how to separate NMR signals coming from cellular background from all other components that are present in cells, from the signals that comes from the DNA under the study. And here basically you see distorted proton spectrum of the cells. And as you can appreciate, there are no signals, and these are empty cells, no signals in the immuno region. Although we should be able to observe, at least in principle, signals from genomic DNA, RNAs, or even small uh, nucleotides, we do not observe them. The reason is that genomic DNA is simply too big, and signals from genomic DNA are broadened by relaxation. Small RNAs uh, have concentrations that are below NMR detection limit, luckily. And immunoprotons from nucleotides such as ATP are in chemical exchange mode, so we don't see them as, uh, as well. However, when we introduce the DNA fragment, we start to observe immuno signals from our DNA. And this is actually the primary source of the information in insulin and NMR. Uh, fortunately, these immuno signals. Uh, provide 
most important information. They actually, the, these signals somehow directly refers to uh, DNA topology. And more specifically, they are informative, they, they keep the information about the hydrogen bonding patterns. So you can discriminate different forms of nucleic acids. For example, you can observe immobilized immunoprotons in CC base pairs with unique position or, or above 15 ppm. You can discriminate these signals for watson crick base pairs, Hooksteins, and you can classify the structures. So this is very important for DNA topological analysis. Uh, also, immunoprotons can be used to monitor the interactions. So this is the example uh, of the complex between the double-stranded DNA and major groove binding drug. This would be the signal pattern for unbound form of the DNA, this very specific signature of DNA ligand complex. Uh, in insel NMR, we normally do not use conventional approaches for spectral interpretation, and I will, I will explain why. But we use something which is called spectral fingerprinting. We record the data in cells, or here incorrectly stated in vivo. And because we cannot really recognize which signal belongs to which structure, what we do, we record in vitro spectra under broad range of conditions. We change pH, temperature, ionic strength, we add molecular crowding mimics, osmo uh, osmotic uh, compounds emulating osmotic stress and so on. And we are trying to find the signature that corresponds to in vivo data. If we succeed to find it, we can go for in vitro structure. If we don't succeed to find such conditions, unfortunately, we will face the problem how to solve the in vitro structure. Uh, as I said, until recently, the insel NMR was restricted to Xenopus livus oocytes. However, in 2018, there was a small breakthrough in the field. There were two methods developed that allow the position of sufficient amount of exogenous DNA into the intracellular space and sufficient for NMR analysis. Uh, one approach is simple modification of the conventional electroporation. Uh, the other approach is based on a reversible permeabilization of the cell membrane with the pore forming toxins. What it, I will just highlight here, uh, we do not work with uh, concentrated solutions anymore. Uh, the concentration of stock solution is between 300 to 400 micromolar. Intracellular concentrations are much closer to the physiological level and are between 5 to 20 micromolar. Uh, this is the setup for in cell NMR in human cells, it's essentially the same as for Xenopus livus oocytes, except we have a possibility to monitor with the confocal microscopy localization of the introduced uh, DNA. And here you will see the signals coming from the nucleus. We can also monitor viability. This two quadrants, sorry, in the flow cytometric plot they contribute to the NMR signals as, and, and as you can appreciate most of the cells here in this lower quadrant, that's the indication that the cells are alive. And then we directly measure in cell NMR spectra. One of the first application of uh, in cell NMR spectroscopy for DNA was uh, on uh, something which is called DNA imotive. It's a non-canonical DNA structure stabilized by CC base pairs. And you can notice that CC base pairs involve protonation of cytosines. And in vitro, this structure generally requires acidic pH. Although there are a lot of data, and there have been a lot of data indicated that these structures might form inside the cells, the requirement for acidic pH 
was basically the main argument why, why there were general doubts that these structures are really functionally relevant. So we used the, in the concept of insulin MR spectroscopy to check whether, first of all, formation of I motor is compatible with intracellular environment. And second, if the folding and unfolding cycle is reversible process for the structure. And this is a relatively simple experiment. We took pre-folded eye motor, we introduced it into the cell, into the cell nucleus, and we recorded the spectrum. We observed signal at characteristic region. This is a clear indication that the eye motor is there. And then what we can do uh, is we can, within uh, temperature range that is still physiological between 20 to 40 degrees, we can increase the temperature and unfold the structure. And then after decreasing the temperature back to 20 degrees, we can see that structure will form back. So this is one of the first application and this is a considered to be one of the first experimental evidences that formation of eye motifs in vivo is possible. Uh, also, this technique can be used for monitoring of DNA ligand binding in intracellular space. In this case, the procedure is slightly modified. First, you preform the complex. You introduce your complex into the cell. And you recorded the spectra. And the spectra interpretation is performed in terms of uh, population of uh, bound and unbound uh, DNA. And that gives you some sort of estimate of uh, uh, environmentally induced dissociation. It gives you the estimate how much cell of targets uh, are playing a role in, um, uh, uh, in ability of the drug to target uh, your molecule of the choice. Uh, in practical application, this can be used for a screening of ligand-specific capacities to form complexes with specific target. This example uh, is double-stranded DNA containing PP mismatch and set of microcyclic ligands. These are intercalating drugs at the site of PP mismatch. And you can see that you will get information, if I put it, simply which ligand binds the best in the presence of intracellular competitors. The ligand one would be the winner. Uh, this is just another example. Uh, the first example was a major groove binder, the intercalating ligands, and then now we have example of the uh, ligand that interacts via stacking interaction, and again, you can see that you are able to monitor the interaction in the cell NMR. This ligand creates stable complex in intracellular environment. Okay, and this is uh, one of the last slides. People from even in cell NMR community working on proteins are often puzzled why we show only one dimensional spectra and very basic NMR analysis. So what is the current state in protein in cell NMR? Uh, these people are usually using uh, isotopically labeled samples, carbon, nitrogen. They can acquire multi-dimensional heteronuclear spectra. They can observe not only chemical shift, but also measure NOEs in intracellular space, scalar coupling, paramagnetic relaxation enhancement, uh, last year, there was a demonstration that it's possible to directly calculate high-resolution 3D structure in living cell. You have a chance to quantitatively describe thermodynamics or intramolecular dynamics for proteins. And beautiful work from uh, Florence. You can also quantitatively describe interactions in the terms of dissociation constants, not in vitro, directly in living cells. On the other hand, in nucleic acid fields, field, uh, the, the possibilities are quite limited. We measure either at natural abundance or recently there were uh, 
examples of fluorine modified nucleic acids. But technically speaking, all applications are limited to one dimensional NMR spectroscopy. Uh, the only parameter that we use for data interpretation is a chemical shift. Uh, applications are mostly qualitative. We use it for topology profiling or maybe qualitative estimate of thermodynamics. We cannot really monitor dynamics. And we can somehow semi-quantitatively describe interactions. Now, why is that? And this is sort of explanation. If you work with proteins in insulin NMR, typical half-life of proteins studied so far was longer than 24 hours. Typical half-life of nucleic acid fragment in intracellular space is generally less than two hours. Intracellular concentrations for proteins in insulin NMR are at 100 micromolar or higher intracellular concentrations for nucleic acid that we have are around 10 micromolar, 10 micromolar, 10 times lower. And last but not least, because this is very substantial factor, it is the cost of the sample. Cost of the isotopically labeled sample for proteins is generally less than 1,000 euro, but it's 10 times more expensive to do the same type of experiment with nucleic acids. In addition, considering a short half-life, you would need many such samples to perform, for example, a set of NMR experiments that would be required to solve three-dimensional structure. So it is possible, but uh, basically it's cost prohibitive. On the other hand, uh, as I said, the DNA in contrast to proteins are extremely environmentally sensitive. This is not just minor changes in the chain orientation, side chain orientations like in the proteins. This, there are major structural uh, transitions. One could clearly say refolding events, uh, binding uh, affinities of ligands with respect to DNA targets are dramatically modulated and dramatically distinct from what we observed under in vitro conditions. So still the insel NMR spectroscopy uh, of nucleic acids will remain a relatively unique tool that allows you to somehow take into account uh, not only non-specific environmental factors that are present inside the cells, but also specific cellular of targets if we are talking about, for example, blood screening. So it is the intricate game involving many players, but in NMR, my report on the final outcome. And with that, I would like to thank all the collaborators from CETEC, from Goethe University in Frankfurt, uh, Institut Curie in Paris, Robert hansel Herich from Cologne, who was basically there from the beginning uh, of the story, and Tomáš Fasil from University of South Bavaria. And thank you for your attention. Lukáš, thank you very much for your nice and elucidating talk. And again, the talk is open to questions. I just had a question. Would you expect that the in-cell NMR analysis of the conformations or structures would actually uncover um, some, some major new structural forms of, say, non-coding sequences, etc.? If you search for new structural forms, you start always in vitro. And then, the, then you are asking yourself the question, is that new structural form that I'm observing compatible with intracellular environment? Um, it's expensive. It's very complicated experiment. It doesn't look like, but it's super tricky to run such an analysis. So I, I, I don't think that it's for a random screening. It's not like that you randomly start to screen dozens of sequences. No, you search for a hit and then you ask the direct question. Okay, okay Lukáš, there is a one question from Q&A section. How long a piece of DNA can you use in vivo? That's a tricky one. It not only depends on the size, but also on the structure. Uh, in terms of size, uh, 
good experience is with fragments that are smaller than 50 nucleotides. Uh, we tried to uh, run intel NMR analysis with piece of RNA that was 72 nucleotide long, and we haven't observed any signals from the RNA uh, in proton spectra. There is a trick how you can convey the structural information. This was a ligand-based study. So this is so far the, the experience, but for example, if someone would be interested about G quadruplexes, here the problem is that these are super highly polymorphic structures and the signals are so broad that even a molecule with 30 nucleotides uh, gives you basically spectra that are not of no use. You cannot. So it really depends how the system behaves. Okay, there are two more questions. The first one, can you do a one hour nosy with the DNA and ligands? Uh, nosy? Yes, nosy. Uh, no, I, I don't think so, that's possible. Basically we measure one dimension of proton spectra and it takes us roughly an hour to get the spectra of the quality you have seen. We are at the signal to noise ratio Five. So we are basically at the level of detection limit. No fancy experiments. You can use the trick with the fluorine, it might get better, but with the protons, I seriously doubt that you can do. Okay, and another question from Abbas Mansur. Nice presentation and work. I have a question. Is there a possibility for nucleic acids interactions between the target DNA to be studied and other DNA, RNA within the nucleus? Uh, we, we probably will hit, um, hit the wall of uh, signal broadening in this case. So far, all attempts were focused either on just assessment of nucleic acid topology, small freely tumbling fragment, and even then we have relatively broad signals. However, what works is a complex between DNA or RNA and small molecule. But I am afraid that interactions between two big pieces so far impossible. So at the end, I would like to thank all the speakers for excellent talks. I would like to thank all the attendees, which were around the 90 at the peak time. And at the end, I would like to invite you to the webinar number eight which uh, will be screened on March 16 from 11 to 12.30 as usual. And this webinar will present the Instruct Center EMBL, a newcomer to Instruct Eric organization. And as you see on the slide, there will be a presentation given by Beata Turonova, Dmitry Svergun and Jozan Marquez. And the chair and moderator of this webinar will be Steven Kusak. So with this, I would like to thank again all the speakers and all of you, and I'm looking forward to meet again on March 16 at 11 a.m. So have a good time and stay healthy. Bye-bye. <laughs>